as I sat in the keynote and looked at the agenda today, the rasopathies really are a treasure trove for any researchers, clinicians, um, healthcare professionals that are interested in neurocognition and behavior and development. Uh, and I hope I can convince you of that today uh, because I've truly now convinced myself something I've always known about, but there's not a lot of work and research in the field yet because it's so new. So I just wanted to introduce today the RASopathies, uh, talking about medical genetic syndromes of the RAS MAPK pathway and its dysregulation and how that happens. And so these are the learning objectives for our CME credit. We are going to talk about the RAS map k pathway, and I'll define that a little bit more, and let you know that this has been very well studied in cancer and why it's considered a cancer pathway, and this is why it's truly the Wild West when it comes to looking at neurocognition and behavior in these, in these kids and adults. And we're going to talk about the syndromes themselves and really which mind boggles me and it's something that I write about is that when you put all these considerably rare syndromes together, they actually make up the most common group of recognizable patterns of malformation in the human population. So what is the RAS pathway? And uh, the RAS pathway is really that signal transduction pathway. And it is so complex. This is actually a very simple diagram of the pathway. Um, but it's, it's a very complex pathway with a lot of crosstalk and interaction. And the bottom line is its job is to get that signal from the outside of a cell, because our cell needs to know what it's supposed to do with the other cells in our body. And so the RAS pathway's job is to get that signal from the outside and get it transduced, transduction signaling pathway, transduced all the way to the nucleus. So the nucleus knows what in the world it's supposed to do. It, it really is a simple concept but it's a very complex pathway. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take you all back one step because I have to explain this pathway to families and patients. And so what I'm gonna do, since I've never really gotten a lot of feedback, I want to explain it to you how I explain it to families and then I'm gonna explain it again how I explain it to researchers. So when I explain this to families, I have to explain, well, what is the RAS pathway and why is it so important? And so what I tell them is, you know, our body is very complex and it's made up of trillions and trillions of cells. And as I said, these cells really need to communicate with one another because they need to know what these cells, the cells themselves are supposed to do and how they're supposed to interact with their, with their counterpart, counterparts and cohorts. And so when I explain the RAS pathway, I let them know that this is the cell and this is the nucleus. This is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell. So the job is, is to get information from the outside of the cell and tell the nucleus what it's supposed to do, okay? So I let them know that, yep, there is a signal on the outside of the cell and it hits the membrane. Okay, but it hits the membrane, there has to be something on the membrane to make sure that that signal gets, again, inside the cell. And so there's this receptor on the cell surface. And this receptor, you can kind of think of it just like a telephone. And you know, the funny thing is, is I actually probably need to put an iPhone in there or something like that, because no one's gonna know what that is. So there's one thing that while I'm talking to you, I probably need to substitute right there. And then, again, no one's going to know what this is, but this is a bucket brigade. And what it is, is this little signal here from the phone needs to actually start marching down towards the nucleus. And so what you have is this bucket brigade, which takes the signal from A to B to C to D and so forth. And then inside the cell, is a switchboard, and no one's going to know what this is either. So, but this is a switchboard that ra is, is RAS, 
And RAS itself, which stands for rat sarcoma virus, again, in cancer, it's a cancer pathway. So RAS is really the signaling hub where it tells the signal in a very complex way depending on how much it was signaled to, from where it was signaled, and, and what, where to put this signal and how to get it down to the nucleus. And in fact, RAS is so complex and so complex in cancer that there's multiple RASs of which three have really been well studied. You've got HRAS, NRAS, and KRAS. In fact, RAS is so complex that there's actually over 20 different RASs inside of our cells. Inside of every single cell in our body, there's over 20 different RASs. It's really considered a RAS family. And so what RAS does is it tells the cell, depending upon what part of the cell cycle the cell is in, what organ the cell is in, where the cell is in our body, it can tell the cell, you know what, it's time to divide. It's, you got to start dividing because otherwise you're going to get left out in the dust. It can also tell our cell, depending on the signal, you know what, it's time for you to start differentiating. You're in a sea of brothers and it's time for you to start becoming different. It can also tell the cell, you know what, you've got some really important stuff going on ahead of you in just a few minutes or a couple hours. You need to start making more components, making more cellular components. RAS can also tell the cell, it's time for you to move. What's, what's really interesting and we have to remember is that our cells in our body aren't static. They're moving all the time. And so RAS is really important for telling our cells you got to start moving. Another really important function which has to do with cancer also is telling the cell it's time for you to live or it's time for you to die. And so it's another important reason. And also in modeling, when you look at our hands and our fingers, there has to be a lot of cell death that actually goes on in, us for, in order for us not to have webbing and to be able to actually have digits. And so that's important also for the RAS pathway function. So that's how I explain it to families. But now I'm going to actually explain it to you, because in order for us to really understand these syndromes, um, you need to know what these components are and what, these, what part of the bucket brigade and everything uh, these are. So as I mentioned, the RAS pathway, it is activated by a lot of extracellular stimuli. And then these particular cell surface receptors that are part of the pathway, and this is the telephone, um, these receptors will receive the stimulus, and it, the receptor itself starts to autophosphorylate. Once it's, once it's signaled to, it actually autophosphorylates, and it gets its own ball running. And then when it autophosphorylates, what it does is it starts to gather its brothers to come forth and to join the receptor so it can actually start that bucket brigade going to get down to the RAS signal. And so what you have is growth factor receptor bound protein or GRAB2. It, it comes up to the receptor and in that time it's also recruiting another component called Son of Sevenless. Son of Sevenless was actually identified in Drosophila and you have SOS or Son of Sevenless and then SHIP2. And SHIP2 is the protein product of PTPN11. And again, just think of this as that bucket brigade, just a lot of components. I call it alphabet soup. So it's this alphabet soup, a lot of components in the soup that have to come together where I had mentioned this telephone exists on the membrane. All right, so that's the bucket brigade. And that's only a fraction of really what's happening, but it's good enough for our purposes to talk about the syndromes. And then once this group has been recruited, then it says to RAS, which hangs out at the membrane for the most part, RAS is really recruited to its membrane and its microdomain, and it interacts with son of sevenless or SOS. And so what's so important about SOS? You already know about RAS and the signaling hub, but SOS itself is this guanine nucleotide exchange factor known as a RAS GEF. And what a RAS GEF is, again, more alphabet soup, is the SOS really helps make the signal go, 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 because if, if it was left up to RAS itself, 
it would sit there and maybe a couple days later it would decide, okay, it's time to really signal. So you need the gas and sauce is that gas to get that signal moving. And then when you have sauce, it really, as I said, it helps speed up RAS, which exchanges GDP and GTP, which is kind of the equivalent of, remember, ATP in the cell, ATP the energy. GTP is also an energy molecule as well. And then as I mentioned, RAS itself is just this really small GTP binding protein. And it does act as this on and off switch. You can kind of think of it that simple, on and off. Like Lily Tomlin sitting there at the switchboard, she's going to be deciding where to plug the signal in. Okay? And then you actually have to, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this because it's more components of the pathway, is then there are these RAS gaps. Because you've got sauce, which is giving the gas go, 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 go. But then you have to have the brake, just like the pedals on your car. You got the go, you got to have the brake right there. And so RAS gaps, or RAS GTPase activating proteins, turn RAS off. So you have to have the go, you have to have the stop. All right. This is a super simple depiction of the RAS pathway and its effectors, its downstream effectors. And this is only four of them in the simplest depiction possible. And so you have lots of downstream effectors. And the amazing thing is, is all of these themselves crosstalk with one another to add complexity. But what we're going to be doing is talking about the RAS mitogen activated um, protein kinase pathway. And why is it called RAS MAPK pathway? Well, it's RAS. And then it's mitogen activated. And what mitogen is, is a little molecule that activates this receptor and makes it go. So that's why it's called mitogen activated. Okay, protein kinase, because these are all kinases and it's a pathway. And this particular pathway is super important in cancer. It is a cancer pathway, very well studied in cancer. In fact, when you look at all cancers, if you looked at if the RAS pathway is affected in 30% of those cancers, and, and that's probably an underestimate, um, but about 30% of cancers, this pathway is activated in the same mechanism that I'm going to talk to you about on the mutations that these kids have as a germline mutation. So when, we, when I talk about these syndromes, yeah, we know RAS is activated in cancer, a somatic mutation. Yeah, we get it. OK, it's important. But what, is, what blew people away and why this is such a hot topic in medical genetics right now, it's because no one thought anyone born with an activated RAS pathway could live. That's why this is so amazing, is because we're not talking about a, a cancer. We're not talking about a kid as a cancer. We're talking about a kid that, who grows up into an adult that actually has this mutation in every single cell in their body. And this is such an important pathway. It's important for cell cycle progression that I showed you about. It's important for transcription and differentiation and survival and motility super important pathway. So that's the overall view of the pathway. Now I'm going to just dive a little bit deeper because there's a lot of different changes in these components of the pathway which cause the mutations and which cause the syndromes. So as I mentioned, RAS itself is a, is a small GTPase and you've got KRAS, HRAS, and NRAS are the major players. And then once RAS is activated, it actually re recruits its downstream brother, um, RAF, from the cytosol to the membrane. And RAF itself also uh, exists as a family. You have BRAF, CRAF, and ARAF. And then these RAFs can go on and um, phosphorylate MEC, MEC1 and MEC2. See, this is the bucket brigade, just kind of downstream from RAS. And then MEC1 and MEC2 go down and activate ERK1 and ERK2. Again, it's just down, down, downstream. But the thing is, is the more complex a pathway, the more you can mess it up. So that's the thing you have to be careful about when you're thinking about this pathway is, you know, yeah, it's important because it's really complex and it's signaling to all of its different pathway effectors and crosstalking.
But the more complex something is, the more you can actually have different ways to mess it up. And then once ERK is phosphorylated, ERK is really that downstream workhorse. ERK goes out into the cytosol, it goes into the nucleus, and it affects hundreds and hundreds of molecules in the nucleus and in the cytosol, and that's where the work, that's where it all happens. Okay. So we talked about how you can turn this pathway on. Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, you have to be able to turn this pathway off. Otherwise, we'd all be walking around as a cancer or we'd be walking around with a rasopathy, okay? So to turn this pathway off, we talked about these RAS gaps, and there's a lot of syndromes associated with these RAS gaps. And you also can turn it off by sprouty, just molecules that help turn the pathway off, sprouty-related proteins like spread, and we're gonna be talking about spread a little bit. And then there's all these inhibitor proteins and kinase suppressors and phosphatases, all of these things that work in conjunction and in, in concert with one another to really modulate the pathway so the signal goes to where it's supposed to go. Very complex, okay. So over the last not even maybe 10, no, not even 10 years yet, I'm not going to be able to say that. So in less than 10 years, so maybe about seven years ago, um, what had happened was uh, all these different syndromes that we're going to talk about today became known and associated with this really important pathway. And we called them the rasopathies. Uh, and so the rasopathies, and we're going to talk about these syndromes one by one, is neurofibromatosis type 1, Noonan syndrome, um, Noonan syndrome with multiple lentigines used to be called leopard syndrome, gingival fibromatosis type 1, and we're not going to really talk about that today. It's just an interest um, from kind of more of an academic point of view. Capillary malformation, AV malformation, which again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, if, if anything. Uh, Costello syndrome, cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome, otherwise known as CFC syndrome. And then you have Lege's syndrome or Legu syndrome. And what's really interesting about this is Lege's syndrome actually became identified because of the pathogenetics of the pathway. And so that's kind of the new syndrome on the block. It used to be called NF1. We'll talk a little bit about uh, Lege's syndrome. And so when you look at this pathway all together, I just want to um, reiterate for this particular group is that, yes, this pathway is super important in cancer, it's been very well studied in cancer. But what's really shaking out and what's allowing us to really focus on now is how important this pathway is in development and how important this pathway is in neurocognition and behavior and learning disabilities and everything like that. You cannot get, you cannot by step the RAS pathway without really you know, studying it or thinking about it when you have learning disabilities and neurologic issues and all of that. And it's super understudied. Actually, a neurologist, um, psychologist, um, all health professionals interested in this type of, of study could, could make a career studying this pathway. So we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit, talk about NF1. So NF1 really was the first rasopathy. NF1, we've known about it for a very long time. NF1, you've known about it with learning disabilities and, and all of that. You know, 50% will talk about that. But I'm sure many of you have seen patients with NF1. And it's autosomal dominant, meaning that it can be passed down from generation to generation, or it can be a brand new mutation in the person. And the way that I like to think about it is about 50-50. 50% are new, 50% are passed down from generation to generation.
and when you think about NF1 from a clinical geneticist point of view, from a medical genetics point of view, one in 3,000 is actually common for medical genetic syndrome. I know it doesn't seem common, but go to AT&T Park or go to the new uh, 49er Stadium where you're, you know, there's 50,000 people, 80,000 people, and count out one in 3,000 individuals, and I'll guarantee you somebody in that stadium has NF1. And so uh, with regards to NF1, there have been diagnostic criteria that have been uh, developed from the NIH. But the thing is, um, and we're going to talk about those diagnostic criteria, it's used now clinically in um, the clinic. However, it was never intended to be so. But because the diagnostic criteria were so robust that we actually use them. And it's caused by haploinsufficiency, meaning you are missing one copy of this uh, protein that turns the pathway, pathway off. And if you're missing your brake as you're driving, you're going to be speeding. So that's why it ramps up the pathway. Okay. So the diagnostic criteria are cafe au lait macules. You know, the general population have a couple. You can have up to two cafe au lait macules considered normal in the general population. But we're talking about six or more cafe au lait macules. And we're also talking about these little mini-max is what I call them. They're a little freckling in the axilla or in the groin region, known as intertriginous region. So in folds where you shouldn't have sun-exposed freckles. Because we can get freckles by living in Davis and living in California, but we're talking about freckles at a very young age where the sun is not supposed to shine. Right? And so neurofibromas. This is something that develops usually a little later in life. Plexiform neurofibromas, really big nerve tumors. Neurofibromas, little tiny skin tumors. That's part of the diagnostic criteria. And of course, pathway, optic pathway gliomas or other brain cancers. And then those hamartomas in the iris, the Lisch nodules. So if you have a, a patient that you're considering maybe this individual child or adult has NF1 by uh, other cutaneous manifestations, send them to the eye doctor, have them check out their eyes uh, for Lisch nodules. Bony lesions can also happen, and of course having a first degree relative with NF1. Okay. But a lot of people look at NF1 and think of lumps and bumps. Okay, and that's kind of where they stop. There's so much more going on in NF1, and that's why it's really important to have a specialty clinic, and there's lots of specialty clinics with, uh, in NF1. Cardiovascular, they can have heart problems, so you really have to make sure their heart's okay. They can have vasculopathies. You really need to make sure that there's not um, pain with walking because it could be a vasculopathy in their leg that's affecting their muscle and blood flow. Um, so you just really have to be careful about that. And everyone knows that with regards to NF1, you really need to make sure their blood pressure is under control. And it's not only because of kidney problems that can cause the blood pressure in NF1 to elevate, but it's also idiopathic hypertension. No one knows, but they definitely get more hypertension idiopathically than the general population. So you have to make sure that's well controlled. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, bone issues are really important. A vitamin D deficiency, even in California where we've got lots and lots of sun and can convert uh, and make vitamin D, they're still deficient. So obviously the RAS pathway is very important in vitamin D synthesis. Scoliosis, vertebral dysplasia. Um, so again, bony abnormalities. So lots of organ systems affected, not just lumps and bumps on the skin. And then what's interesting is some individuals with NF1 have a Noonan syndrome, a cranial facial feature, and we'll talk about Noonan syndrome next. It's definitely a cousin syndrome. So neurologic findings, trust me, a plenty. I don't think I've met really one NF individual. And I've talked to specialists who actually study neurocognition in NF1, especially as kids go to college, lots and lots of learning issues and learning disabilities and executive functioning come out. So the neurologic findings, again, the lumps and bumps, neurofibromas and plexiform neurofibromas, those cause neurologic issues. And the CNS tumors, of course, neurologic issues. But when you look on MRI, big brains, 
So, uh, and actually big brains have been now associated with the RAS pathway. So it's very important in development. So megalencephaly, and then unusual findings which have been known about for a very long time are called those unidentified bright objects that they really do come and go on MRI. And there's no association with learning issues or anything like that. And even till this day, they're not exactly sure what these UBOs are. Is it a vascular issue? Is it a small tumor you need to watch out for? And so that's why when there are UBOs that MRIs might be done serially for a while. Hypothalamic hamartomas can be seen, probably one of the most common uh, hamartomas, and Chiari-1 malformations. So Chiari-1 malformations, that's where the tonsils of the cerebellum kind of push their way through that little hole or the foramen magnum at the bottom of your skull. Little bits of the tonsils of the brain can actually ride down through the foramen magnum. And what's really starting to shake out and why it's so important to now study these rasopathies as a whole is because not only is it an NF1, but it's in Costello syndrome, CFC syndrome, Noonan syndrome. And so learning from one syndrome of a rasopathy is really teaching us a lot about other rasopathies because of the common underlying pathogenetic mechanism. These individuals can also have ventriculomegaly and hydrocephaly, a very common theme also with the rasopathies, very common. But the one thing that we see a lot in the clinic and really does have activities of daily living issues, school issues, learning issues, kids that want to go to college, and then, you know, employment, is neurocognitive delays, as I mentioned, learning disabilities. They can be hypotonic. And hypotonia was never anything that really was kind of important or thought about in NF1. We've known about NF1 for a very long time. This is not something new. Um, but hypotonia was never really appreciated. And the work that we are actually doing on skeletal muscle in other syndromes is really starting to feed back into hypotonia is an important issue in NF1. Motor delays, behavioral issues, ADHD is much more common. Autism. Oh my goodness, there has been very big controversy in the literature about autism and NF1. In fact, you talk to NF1 experts who've been in the field for decades and they still won't believe it, even though there's now literature out there to support this. But what's also really supporting this is now when you're looking at autism or autism traits, it's not only NF1, and I'm here to say it is associated with NF1, but it's not only NF1, but we're seeing other rasopathies starting to shake out in autism. And the thing is, is this is not surprising. There were some excellent science articles, nature articles, about uh, RAS pathway in autism. Here you have individuals born with an activated RAS pathway that are coming up with autism, autism-like traits. And so the thing is, is yes, there is a connection. Um, boy, I sounded like I was on the pulpit on that one, didn't I? So uh, seizures, so seizure disorders, about up to 10%, and they're not all associated with the brain tumors. Um, they can just have idiopathic seizures. And again, this is also shaking out in the other rasopathies. Sleep disturbances, adults and kids alike. Multiple sclerosis, peripheral neuropathies. Peripheral neuropathies also really understudied in all of the rasopathies, these neuropathies. Um, and this is, this is, I think, if somebody were to do a real systematic study, this is probably a big issue, especially as these individuals get older. And headaches, also really important, especially migraine headaches, but just idiopathic headaches, just headaches. And it seems to be associated with dehydration. It's kind of something that over the last several years as I had my RAS clinic, which we'll talk a little bit about later, is I, I started thinking about, you know, the kids are telling me I'm getting headaches, and I'm going, well, what are you doing? When is it, what's precipitating it? And dehydration. So I really let them know, and I have no evidence for this. I haven't done a study on this, but I ask, you know, have you been hydrating? Are you, yeah, the headaches are better. So it's kind of interesting what's going on kind of physiologically with these individuals. And moya moya, so this is something also, this is that vasculopathy in the brain. 
um, that has been associated with NF1, and the question is, is Moya Moya going to be associated with other RAS apathies? There's anecdotal evidence, like with regards to Costello syndrome and Moya Moya, which we'll talk about, but um, Moya Moya is something that, so headaches are taking very seriously. Um, this is a cancer pathway, as I mentioned. I just want to briefly mention about the cancers. If you've got a patient with NF1, the point I'm trying to make here is it is a cancer syndrome. So another reason why we take signs and symptoms very, very seriously as well, because it can be associated with cancer. Okay, Noonan syndrome. Noonan syndrome, a very close cousin of NF1, and you can kind of see why. Here's where NF1 is, and look at the bucket brigade and all the affected um, uh, genes and, and proteins that are involved in Noonan syndrome. So when you think about Noonan syndrome, just like NF1, 50-50, very easy to remember. You gotta love this pathway. 50% passed down from generation to generation, 50% brand new mutations within the child or, or the adult. From a population point of view, and I, the one, one in one to a thousand, one in one to two thousand, that's kind of literature lore, something that um, was out there in the literature and it never really got studied uh, even further or what have you. But you know what? The more that I see these rasopathies and see people on TV with Noonan syndrome and all of this, um, I, it is going to be about one in 800 or so, if not even more. Um, and so, again, put these all together, and it's common. Lots and lots of different genes uh, cause Noonan syndrome. PTPN11, KRAS, RRAS, um, uh, NRAS, Sybil, SHOCK2. I mean, it's just, again, alphabet soup. So lots and lots. And these are activating pathways. Unlike NF1, which is one of the genes is taken away, these types of mutation are little changes in the nucleotide that actually change a little amino acid in the protein and make it rev up. So it's activation, that's what makes this pathway activated, is these types of mutations. This, if you were to do a panel, say you have a clinical diagnosis of Noonan syndrome or suspect Noonan syndrome, there's panels out there, which is a very cost-effective way you have about a 75% chance with a solid clinical diagnosis, maybe now 80 or so, 70, 75 to 80, um, where you're going to find a gene mutation, but there's actually still more genes to be identified, and it's going to be genes associated with the pathway. I just want to spend a brief time about the clinical features because this is, as medical geneticists and healthcare providers, how you make a diagnosis. And it's a lot easier to make the diagnosis in, in a younger child because we as geneticists are so used to seeing, this is with all the pictures in the books, this is what we see when we get called for a consult. And the adult population hasn't really caught on that genetics is important in the adult population, but that's changing. So if you make, if you see a kiddo, what you're looking for is this high boxy forehead, maybe some curly hair. Everyone else in the family has straight hair and this child has curly hair. Eyes that are widely spaced apart, more so than the general population. But hypertelorism is actually a very common, um, meaning your eyes are spaced wide apart. It's very common in the population. In fact, when you look at models, most of them are hypertelloric because it's very stunning to have eyes that are uh, spaced wide apart. Down slanting palpebral fissures, it looks like their eyes are a little droopy. Low set posterior rotated ears. I make a lot of diagnoses of actors that have Noonan syndrome on television because they always have their hair covering over their ears and you can Google them and see where their head, oh my God, their ears are down here. So again, these are common features, harder to tell an adult, much easier to see in a younger child. Just like in, in NF1, Noonan syndrome also has cardiovascular anomalies, but much, much more. In fact, a lot of Noonies are picked up because of their heart problem, and then they see these other features. But cardiovascular issues are about 80% as opposed to about 20 to 25%. With pulmonic valve stenosis, so if you have a kiddo 
or have a young adult that had a history of pulmonic valve stenosis and, you know, oh, it got better, we didn't need surgery, you know, yeah, Johnny grew out of it, but you have a history of pulmonic valve stenosis, you have to think rasopathy, especially with learning issues and learning disability or something like that, that just has to pop up into your head. Um, and also, you know, take a look at the child and see, uh, is the, you know, cranial facial features a little bit out of the norm of the rest of the family. And it can be so subtle that you can't actually pick it up. Growth and development. Growth and development also affected in um, rasopathies and pretty much all the, in fact, all of the rasopathies. Um, but for Noonan syndrome, the height is usually at the lower level of a Caucasian uh, curve. However, there are some genes, there's a genotype phenotype that's shaking out. Individuals with SOS mutations don't have the height issue which is really interesting. You know, why is SOS one spared and the other ones aren't? Again, people can spend and are spending their careers studying the rasopathies right now. There's very rare growth hormone deficiency, frank growth hormone deficiency, but growth hormone is used, um, FDA approved for Noonan syndrome. Even if they're not growth hormone deficient, and you want to get more height on the child. So it's not uncommon to have somebody on growth hormone even though they're not growth hormone deficiency for Noonan's. And then they have these skin findings. You know, we talk about skin and lumps and bumps a lot in NF1. However, in Noonan syndrome and the other rasopathies, lots of skin findings, but certainly not to the level and not to the same degree and not to the same lumps and bumps as NF1. But you know, in Noonan syndrome individuals, cafe au lait macules, lentigenes, which are kind of like cafe au lait macules, those are those birth spots that we all have, but they can have a few more. Keratosis pilaris, that's that bumpy goose flesh that a lot of teens get, especially on the extensor surfaces of their arms and their legs. You know, that, that goose flesh that waxes and wanes. The entire pathway, keratosis pilaris, is very common, and it doesn't wax and wane. I mean, it's there, and it's there to stay. Hematologic issues, if you have a, a kiddo or even a young adult or an adult, you have to just make sure that there's not a bleeding diathesis in Noonan syndrome. Um, edema is something that's really understudied. You know, lymphedema, especially as individuals get older, they start getting puffy on their extremities because especially Noonan syndrome as compared to the others, but the others have this issue too, but not to the degree. Edema, lymphedema is a big problem. This is, this is a, a, a lymph problem in, NF, in Noonan syndrome, and a lot of kiddos are actually can be diagnosed in utero. A lot of fetos, fetuses can be diagnosed in utero because of anasarca, edema, high drops, increased nuchal translucency. So in the newborn period, if you have a heart problem, increased nuchal translucency, you have to think rasopathy. There are just some things you have to think rasopathy. Neurologic. So again, neurologic cognitive behavioral disorders are very common in Noonan syndrome. Noonan syndrome and NF1 were kind of like, oh, you know, compared to the other rasopathies, not so much. But let me tell you, when you really dissect down and you really drill down into the different neurologic, cognitive, and behavioral issues, there's enough going on there that you really have to be aware of really have a low threshold of tolerance for testing. I mean, this is something I write in all my reports. I mean, yeah, we're really glad everything's going well right now, but it doesn't necessarily mean this is how it's going to be the rest of their life. And that's one thing about the rasopathies is this is a really evolving group of syndromes. What you get in the newborn period is very different than what you get as a young child, which is very different than what you get as a preteen to an adolescent, to a young adult, and to an adult. It's all different. Their phenotype and what they have is all different at different ages. So uh, the point I really want to make about Noonan syndrome is, is it is very variable. Um, they can have brain abnormalities, so having a very low threshold for getting an MRI is something that's important to keep in mind. 
and what they can have more seen than often um, it, as far as other brain issues is the Chiari 1 malformation that I talked about in NF1 where a little bit of the brain kind of pokes its way through, down through that hole in the bottom of our skull, the foramen magnum. Hydrocephalus or ventriculomegaly is also seen, and again, it's seen throughout the entire pathway. That's why you just got to love the pathogenetics behind it all. And children with Noonan syndrome really have hypotonia. So if you have a young adult, if you have an adolescent and you're thinking, wow, you know, maybe this is a rasopathy in Noonan syndrome, always get a feeding history. Because, you know, if the kid's 10 years old or 12 years old, the family might forget, oh, yeah, gosh, we did have a bad problem with feeding in the newborn stage. Um, but feeding issues really do shake out when you probe um, medical history early on. Poor coordination, behavioral dis difficulties, irritability, I mean, fine motor uh, speech delays. Uh, fine motor control, and I unfortunately see this a lot, not only in Noonan syndrome, but in CFC syndrome, where there'll be this note from neurology that says, you know, grossly normal, okay. And then you have a teenager that can barely write her name. And she's like, wow, this is not right. And so it's so important to have a neurologist that's willing to work with you and really, again, focus on that really fine motor, really fine speech problems um, that, again, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, what, what any type of ther therapy is going to help because we want to see these kids go to college and we want to see them thrive. Autistic traits have been identified also in Noonan syndrome. They definitely have ocular issues and they can have hearing issues, so we always recommend annual hearing screen and um, eye exam. Peripheral neuropathies, I gave a neurology grand rounds yesterday at UC Davis, and I had this up here, and one of the neurologists raised their hand and said, oh my god, this is the first time I've seen a neuropathy associated with Noonan syndrome. And I said, you know, it's not a lot out there in the literature. It's a problem that's associated with NF1. We see it anecdotally in the other rasopathies, but it's there, and people need to be aware of it. Just because it's not in the, out in the literature doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means it hasn't been published yet. No one's really systematically looked at it. I've met a lot of Noonies um, that are lawyers and doctors and, and all of that, and for the most part, normal intelligence, high intelligence, um, but up, up to about 40 to 50 percent will require special education. And just like in NF1, and I've seen a lot of families where, again, mom and dad are doctors, mom and dad are high-functioning professionals, they have a, a singleton um, with NF1, so a new mutation in the family. And so they have a very intelligent gene pool, you know, very high expectations of their child. And you just let them know that, look, we're starting here. You guys are very high functioning. You're going to have a lot of high expectations. You're going to be putting your child through a lot of uh, therapy and making sure that this child actually um, gets the necessary things that they need to be the best functioning that they can be. But just like a Noonan syndrome, just like if on average you're looking at an IQ that is about 10% from the rest of, uh, 10 points lower than the rest of the family. So you just, I just lay the foundation. There's a lot out there in the literature now on NF1 for sure, and now more starting to shake out with regards to Noonan syndrome as well. It's a cancer syndrome. I just want to mention this um, because, again, signs and symptoms, you just got to be really aware if you've got a patient with a rasopathy, this is a cancer syndrome. And another good reason to, to have them also followed by a specialty clinic, like a, a RAS pathway clinic, like what we have. I'm just going to mention Noonan syndrome with multiple antigenes, formerly known as leopard. It's actually caused by the same, a couple of the same genes as Noonan syndrome, a couple of the same genes. These individuals have a phenotype that is Noonan syndrome-like, if not Noonan's syndrome. So I, it's now called Noonan syndrome with multiple antigenes. It used to be called leopard syndrome based on an acronym of lentigenes, EKG defects, ocular hypertelorism. Again, same old stuff that we see in, in Noonan's.
The reason why it's still a little bit separated from the rest of Noonan syndrome is because for the most part, instead of getting cafe au lait macules in these birth spots that they can get, they have lentigines, which are these little round oval dark spots. And when you look at the two mutations, PTPN11 is one of the genes and RAF1 is another of the genes that can be mutated, there are very specific mutations in this gene which not only activate the RAS pathway, but also activate the next door pathway, the PI3 kinase pathway. So different mutations in the same gene activate different pathways downstream of RAS differently, which is contributing to the excitement of studying in the laboratory these syndromes, but it, it's also hard to dissect out the function. So it, that's why you can spend your career studying all of this. Costello syndrome. So the next couple of syndromes we're going to talk about, Costello syndrome and CFC syndrome, are really the syndromes that I study in the laboratory. Um, in the laboratory, and the reason why I chose those two particular syndromes, it's because when you look at Costello syndrome due to HRAS, and then you look at CFC, which we're going to talk about next, which is the MAPK pathway. So this is the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway down here. It's really allowing you to dissect the function of the pathway. That's why this pathway is so beautiful to look at it in development. Because RAS, as you know, remember I said RAS signals to all these different pathways downstream? Well, it's great to study Costello syndrome because we're looking at all the different signaling that it can happen downstream. But when you compare it to CFC syndrome, we're now looking at just a pathway downstream from RAS, which is, which, as we know yet, and I bet we're going to find out that it does crosstalk a lot with other pathways. So that's why we study these two. But I'm going to talk about Costello first. So Costello syndrome, unlike NF1, which is common from a medical genetic standpoint, unlike Noonan's, which is common from a medical genetic standpoint, Costello syndrome and CFC syndromes are the more rare cousins in the pathway. And it's probably more rare because the mutations, even though they might happen at the same frequency in the sperm, and most of this is due to, unfortunately, sperm mutations, um, it's probably because it's not compatible with life. So there have actually been some studies done in, in men's sperm looking at HRAS mutations and BRAF mutations and NF mutations and all these mutations commonly seen in rasopathies. And what they're finding is the mutations are there, but what you get at the other end after development is there was probably a lot of spontaneous abortions early on that were more of the CFC caused causing mutations and more of the Costello causing mutations and that NF mutations and Noonan's mutations are more compatible with development. So that the pathway is probably not as activated upstream as it is now when you start to mutate RAS and, and the, uh, the MAPK pathway downstream, which is also really, really interesting when you th really think about it. Maybe you have to have a couple of drinks to get excited about it, I don't know. But it is really interesting when you think about the mutations that are happening in sperm and think about the development and what is probably compatible and not compatible with life. So Costello syndrome, again, more of the rare ones, and it's caused by mutations in HRAS. And again, this blew people away. How can you have this cancer-causing mutation in every single cell and actually have it compatible with development and life? And so I'm not going to go over all of this. I just want to show that when you look at the newborn period, that when you look at Noonan syndrome and you look at Costello syndrome, you know, we get called on consults on there's multiple congenital anomalies. What is this? Can you make a molecular uh, diagnosis from a clinical phenotype? And so that's what we do as a medical geneticist is we try to find out what that molecular lesion is based on phenotype. 
And the facial characteristics are pretty much just like Noonan syndrome, but what I teach the fellows is that for the most part, not always, but for the most part, Costello syndrome, the features are much more coarse. And they're probably much more coarse, especially cranial facially, um, and their skin, and they're born big kids. Even though they might be born early, um, you know, 36, 37 weeks, so they're usually born early, they're real macrosomic, big bodies, and that's because they have so much water weight gain. And then what happens is um, all that water gets shed off in the newborn period, um, and they then, if they don't end up with the G-tube or get fed by, the, by an NG tube or by nasal gastric feeding, is they will waste away to uh, just a waif in the sense that they lose so much weight that it's life-threatening. But they look a lot alike early on. Cardiac-wise, just like Noonan syndrome, 80%. 80% with cardiac problems. The most common being, again, pulmonic stenosis. But hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this actually came from a young man about 30 years old. He actually was found deceased in his home, in his family's home, um, and this is his heart. And so this is a very, this is the wall. The wall is not supposed to be that thick in the ventricle. And so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a really big problem. And 80%, so just because there might be 20% born without a heart problem, just like in Noonan syndrome, just like in Costello syndrome, and <clears throat> as I'll tell you, CFC syndrome, 20% don't have a heart problem early on. But the thing is, is they still really need to be followed um, into their adult life and beyond because they can develop a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or an enlarged heart, even though early on they didn't have one. So again, evolving syndromes you need to keep tabs on and keep them followed. Cutaneous findings. So the skin in all of the rasopathies is amazing. And this is really a dermatologist's dream. In fact, there have now been lots of derm papers on the skin of these rasopathies. And of course, it's obvious for NF1, lots of lumps and bumps. A lot has been done. A lot has been um, written about the lumps and bumps in, in NF1. But now with these cousin syndromes, there's actually more excitement about the pathway as a whole in skin development. So cutaneous findings is what's, what's interesting is this is a 30-year-old female and a very coarse facies. In fact, almost looks like she has a storage disease, you know, a, a genetic storage disorder. Um, but she doesn't. She's got Costello syndrome. And she looks like she walks around with a perpetual tan. So these individuals are hyperpigmented in general. And it's not because of ethnic background. It's because of the neurocrest cell development um, that is involved in RAS pathway activation. Very doughy, soft, velvety skin with deep creases. This actually helps in a genetic, a clinical diagnosis. These little warty papillomas, this is something that can be seen not in the newborn period, but as the child becomes of school age, they get these little warts around their nose and little warts around mucous membranes like their anus or their mouth or something like that. But they can be also seen just on the skin. But this is not due to a virus. It's not a regular wart. It's just due to RAS, HRAS activation in the skin. Acanthosis nigricans, that's that darkening of the skin folds, darkening around the neck, darkening, darkening in the armpit darkening in the groin, the skin darkening. So acanthosis nigricans can be seen much more common actually in Costello than any of the other syndromes, which is really interesting. Again, it's probably because you're, you're having this activation down the MAPK pathway, but you're also signaling to the PI3 kinase pathway. So that's probably the difference. Cafe au lait macules, just like in NF1. Retention hyperkeratosis, that means, you know, we all slough skin. Every single day we're sloughing skin. That's just part of what our skin does to maintain health. 
their skin doesn't slough that well. And so they actually get skin, dead skin buildup. It's called retention hyperkeratosis. And that's seen in older individuals. They can get these nevi, just like in all the other uh, rasopathies. And this is what is so amazing. I just, I just love this slide because they get this hyperkeratosis, which just means calluses, right? Calluses in the hands, calluses on the feet. And we all get calluses. I mean, if we've got ill-fitting shoes or something like that, you know, we, we will get calluses from walking, or if we play tennis a lot, you'll actually get a callus on the palm of your hand. Um, but this is what is so amazing. Look at these calluses on the dorsum of her, of her hand. And what is even more amazing is it's in the exact same pattern on both hands. Like, she's not getting this from playing tennis. This is just activation of the RAS pathway. I think somebody could spend their career studying her hands, you know, I mean, it's just so amazing. Hair is also affected. So for the most part, uh, Newton syndrome, Costello syndrome, and CFC syndrome, you get curly hair, but not always. Development, just like in Noonan's, is also affected. So the RAS pathway is really important in development and growth. And a, a lot of these kids with Costello, and this is an 11-year-old right here, a lot of these kids are growth hormone deficient. And so if they're growth hormone deficient, you give them growth hormone. They can be hypoglycemic at birth, musculoskeletal issues, eye issues, osteopenia. Again, this is the same stuff that we see in NF1 and in Noonan syndrome. Neurologic findings, lots. Motor delays and speech delays, seizures. So seizures is kind of underappreciated in Costello, but it's seen pretty much at the same frequency as Noonan syndrome and seen pretty much at the same frequency as NF1. So it's about 10%. They can have dystonia, movement disorders. Again, a little understudied, um, but as they get older, they can have these issues. When there's a diagnosis of Costello syndrome made, you really want to get an MRI because, again, large brains, Chiari malformations, just like the other syndromes, agenesis of the corpus callosum, hydrocephalus, ventriculomegaly, Dandy Walker malformation, you really want to do get an MRI. Sleep disturbances um, happen, autistic traits, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, and the majority have verbal and nonverbal intellectual skills. And what's interesting is the mild to moderate range. Um, they're not like, uh, like CFC syndrome um, uh, highly affected, uh, which is also very, very interesting. This is a cancer syndrome, okay? So we have to watch for cancers as well. So I'm just gonna do a comparison with cutaneous syndrome. Again, rare, just like what we talked about. It's due to the MAP-K pathway downstream from RAS, possibly KRAS as well. And what's, what we're finding is KRAS mutations. There are some KRAS mutations which signal downstream to MAP-K and some KRAS mutations which signal more to the PI3 kinase pathway. So it's very mutation dependent. Same clinical craniofacial features, very common, same old features. Cardiac, again, I, it's 80%. So even though it's cardio, facio, cutaneous, heart, face, skin syndrome, 20% have normal hearts. And I get a lot of geneticists emailing me going, ah, I think this kid has CFC syndrome, but there's no heart problem. And I remind them, look, 20% don't have a heart problem, but you need to keep following them. You want to make sure that they stay heart healthy. And they also have musculoskeletal abnormalities as well. The ectodermal findings in CFC, 100%, just like in Costello, 100% have, have skin findings. Curly hair, absent eyebrows. They can have uh, flaky skin, dry skin, eczema, cafe au lait macules. Hemangiomas, this is a study that we did, and we were really surprised by this hemangiomas. Um, about 25% will have hemangiomas. Um, again, missing eyebrows. This, this is kind of an inflammation uh, which causes the eyebrows, follicles, uh, hair follicles to fall out. It's called erythema oophorogenes, and they can have a, a erythema of the skin.
the keratosis pilaris I talked to you about. This is the one thing I want to point, um, the moles, the pigmented moles. So this is actually how we identified the gene um, as a best guess, because this is a kiddo, same kiddo with a MEK mutation at 10 months of age. And if you could really look here, there's like two tiny little moles, one right here, one right here, that actually you probably wouldn't even call them a typical mole. When he was 10 years old, he was dotted with moles. And when I was actually looking at pictures of these kids, because I had serial pictures as I was trying to figure out and identify what the gene was, um, for CFC syndrome, the one thing that really struck me was, oh my gosh, all these moles. And so I, what I did was I actually picked up the phone and called the families and I said, have you noticed little Johnny getting moles as he's gotten older? And every parent said, no, no, he doesn't have a lot of moles. I said, can you do me a favor and go back and look? They walked back, looked at the kiddo, and came back to the phone and went, oh my gosh. I, it is, it happened over such a, you know, long, I've never noticed all these moles, which is amazing. This is how slowly these moles start developing. But it's very common in CFC syndrome and not in the other syndromes to just actually have individuals with tons of moles. I want to dive into the neurologic findings. So we did a study of individuals with CFC syndrome and we looked at mutation positives, almost 40 individuals, 100% had hypotonia, motor delay, speech delay, learning disability. 60% had macrocephaly, and about a third had corticospinal uh, tract findings. Almost every single kiddo had some kind of ocular issue, optic nerve abnormalities, ortosis, strabismus, mystagmus, and that the important thing is, is their eyes, they really need to be followed by a, a neuro-ophthalmologist. Seizures, this was probably our biggest finding. We were absolutely blown away by the percentage of individuals with seizures. And they're not your typical seizures in the sense that, you know, one, one therapy works just great. These kids are on polytherapy, lots and lots of different uh, seizure meds, and they still aren't controlled. They've tried ketogenic, they've tried all kinds of stuff. But what really was really interesting was infantile spasms. Infantile spasms are not that common. They are associated with a few genetic disorders. Um, and what's really amazing is infantile spasms, which is demonstrating that the MAP-K pathway, we don't see this in Costello or upstream in Noonan's or even in NF1, but the MAP-K pathway is really also important in seizure, seizure activity, ident you know, predisposition to seizures and brain development. MRI findings, again, with the diagnosis, the, the child has to get an MRI, look for ventricular megaly or frank hydrocephalus. They can have a perivascular spaces that are enlarged, abnormal myelination, Chiari-1 malformation. They can have cysts or just uh, heterotopias, meaning that pieces of the brain are not where they're supposed to be. Is this a cancer syndrome? I get this question all the time, and the answer is probably yes. We're just in the process of writing up a paper where ALL is much more common in CFC syndrome than the general population. And I just want to mention this about now that we've actually been able to do molecular uh, um, typing of the genes that are identified, we're really defining the CFC phenotype. So this is a kiddo that came to, um, to see Eve Lacasse in uh, uh, Louisiana at LSU. And you know, he made this is probably Noonan syndrome. And this is the importance of getting family history. Because he actually asked, can you bring in some family pictures? You know, we're gonna send for molecular testing. <coughs> molecular testing for Noonan's was negative. And he went, wow, this is really weird. Can you bring in some pictures of the family? This is a picture of the family that was brought in. And I just want to point out, this is about circa 1965 here. This is the family in Louisiana. And you look at these kids here, and look at mom, and they have a craniofacial phenotype of something. So there's something in the family, but for them, this is the way that they look. And so when you look, 
and you put them in a pedigree here, these are mom, this is mom, this is the kiddo, the proband that got brought in, and they went on to look for CFC mutations in MEC1 and MEC2, and actually the, the family, the entire four generation family, and it actually goes back further just by history, um, have MEC2 mutations in the family. Lot, there were learning disabilities and, and things like that, but you know, they're holding, some of them are holding down jobs, and they have driver's license and things. So so it's a very mild MEC mutation. I just want to mention Legia's syndrome, the new kid on the block. It used to be called NF1-like, NF1-like syndrome. So uh, Eric Legues um, actually had a cohort in Belgium, actually had a cohort of patients with NF1, a clinical diagnosis of NF1 who didn't have an NF1 mutation, a neurofiber mutation. And what they did was just by kind of candidate sequencing, <coughs> pardon me, sequenced um, some genes that possibly could be, and they found mutations in SPREAD1. It's now called Legia's syndrome, which again, NF1-like. These individuals have cafe au lait macules, they have the freckling, they can have some mild learning uh, delay, learning disability, but they don't have the omas, they don't have the lish nodules, they don't have the plexiforms, they don't have the lumps, pretty much the lumps and the bumps like NF1. And it's caused by a spread one mutation which helps turn the pathway off. So these, these families are missing the breaks. There's not been a lot of the neurologic uh, cognitive or behavior of Legia's syndrome because there very, very few studies have been done, but Eric Legia's, Eric Legius is how we pronounce his name. We, we say Legia's in America, uh, his, it's pronounced Legius. They actually looked at a cohort of patients, a small number of families, and found that the IQ is generally you know, around 100 in the normal range. But if you compare uh, to unaffected family members, they have a little bit lower performance IQ. Um, but the important point of this uh, topic was kind of anticipatory guidance. If you have a, a family with Legia's syndrome as opposed to NF1, because they want to know what are they in for neurocognitively. And so the cognitive phenotype from the study showed that it's actually not as severe or as much milder than having a diagnosis of NF1. And that was kind of the important thing to shake out of that study. So these are the rasopathies. We did skip over a couple of them, the capillary malformation and the gingival fibromatosis. But the thing is, is the important point is it's a common pathogenetic mechanism that results in a common but somewhat different phenotype depending upon where the mutation is. But how neurocognition behavior development is really affected in every single one of these uh, rasopathy syndromes. And I just want to mention, we briefly, study, uh, briefly published autism traits in the rasopathies. I had mentioned about NF1 and its association with autism. There's now lots and lots of new studies out there really taking a closer look, look that NF1 and autism are associated. But the question was, you know, anecdotally, I heard of a lot of kids with CFC syndrome that had a diagnosis of autism. So Lori Weiss and I got together to look at autism traits through screening mechanisms at the other rasopathies. And so just very quickly, just want to go over the social communication questionnaire. So this was done by questionnaires to the families and using um, individuals with autism spectrum disorder diagnoses here on the questionnaire of which uh, you can look here in autism spectrum disorders compared to siblings, you have a high score versus a 2% or very low score. And so th these were our benchmark controls, then looking at other rasopathies, NF1, Costello syndrome, Noonan syndrome, and then CFC syndrome. So you can actually l almost put the pathway on top of this diagram and see where the autism traits are really starting to show an effect here. NF1, we already know there's frank autism associated, so that was also kind of good to see, okay, about 10% in, in our cohort. So this, these are patients that either came to our RAS clinic at UCSF or we recruited them from family meetings. Costello syndrome due to HRAS, about 19%. 
Noonan syndrome, about 25%. This was the real shocker because no one kind of thought Noonan syndrome. I mean, these are the intellectually uh, normal range people, you know, behavioral cognition kind of in the, within the normal range. This was actually really interesting. And then CFC syndrome was a huge surprise, but yet not a surprise to me uh, in the sense that this is so important in development of the brain. This is, you're looking at the MAPK pathway, which is directly upstream from that workhorse ERK. Remember I talk, told you about ERK and how that's the work, workhorse? So with phospho ERK, this is the one that's right upstream and is really um, phosphorylating ERK. Also looking at the social responsiveness scale again, uh, and looking at autism tra traits by uh, questionnaire is this is looking at kind of your typical normal range and then with autism spectrum disorder from typical moderate to severe, a beautiful bell-shaped curve um, within the study population. And then we put on this NF1 here, which again, typical to moderate, a couple in the severe range here, that's NF1. Costello syndrome, you're kind of starting to sh see a shift over here in the typical, kind of shifting more towards mod uh, moderate, no one in the severe range. And then Noonan syndrome, remember I told you that it's very heterogeneous, a lot of different genes involved, not enough patients to see if there's a genotype-phenotype correlation shakeout here, but again, the range from just typical now to moderate, a few and severe, and then CFC syndrome really shifting that bell-shaped curve over into the moderate range. So Lori is following up on all of this and has actually done actual um, uh, testing and is again starting to show that uh, testing is, 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 is correlating to these initial questionnaires. I just wanted to let you know because of this pathway and because of the common actual from a medical genetic standpoint, uh, we started a clinic. I mean, it was the real obvious thing to do to, there's a lot of NF clinics in the country and around the world, lots of NF clinics studying NF1, NF2, schwannomatosis. UCSF surprisingly didn't have an NF clinic, so years and years ago when I said, gosh, I want to start this RAS clinic, you know, made sure that I wasn't stepping on anyone's toes, so we started an NF clinic and added on all the other RASopathies. I honestly thought my first clinic had two patients in it, and I went, oh my gosh, okay, this is what I'm in for. And then within a few months, I actually couldn't keep up with the demand. So we have an, uh, we started, just launched our RAS clinic at UC Davis. So we launched that last month. And what mo the model that we have is a little bit different, and I think this is why it caused, again, a big splash around the world, and now everyone around the world's got this RAS clinic a RAS clinic, is we really focus on uh, educating the family and the parents. We see all ages. I can have a prenatal case um, in clinic, and then I can have an 80-year-old adult in clinic. So medical genetics is not just for pediatrics anymore. We see everybody, all ages, all ages. Adults, kids, prenatal. We created this uh, referral network within UCSF, and now I'm recreating it here at UC Davis, where we have pediatric providers, adult providers, because a big problem with medical geneticists, and I bet you guys see this problem too, is there's a lot of physician refusal. No one wants to take a, a case, no one wants to take a patient which takes a lot of time that is out of the 15 minute appointment range. And you've got individuals with multiple congenital anomalies, you've got individuals with behavioral issues, learning issues, things like that. Docs don't want to see that, they don't have time. So what we did was I just couldn't take that anymore, so I identified my own physicians that I said, look, I will help you. I, I will write for you in detail everything that this kiddo or adult needs to follow, to monitor. I am with you every step of the way. You can call me for questions. I got 65 docs to sign up just like that. You know, they wanted to be supportive. And the other thing is, it's community docs. You know, this is at a major medical center, UC Davis, UCSF. I mean, this, we, we are a tertiary care center. We see the hard cases.
It's the community docs also a lot of physician refusal. And so again, we let them know we are here to help. Our reports are very comprehensive, like all of your reports are very comprehensive. We will guide you every step of the way. We are here for your questions. And then also with the RAS Clinic, we invited the advocacy groups to be a part of this, to make sure that we have the best practices for these individuals. We had at UCSF, and I'll put together a scientific advisory board. Again, we just want to make sure that we are doing all the right things medically for this population of patients. And, every, and what we were, we were, even though we were a clinical uh, um, enterprise and we saw patients, it was also a research clinic as well. Uh, where every single patient that walked through the door was invited to be part of our research, um, hopefully clinical translational, moving towards clinical trials. Because the one thing about this cancer pathway is it's druggable. There are drugs sitting on shelves already out there that are for cancer that could absolutely positively impact these patients' life. You don't want to drug them at a high level, you know, like a cancer, but you dial it down like an insulin uh, impacting glucose, you dial it down like Lipitor impacting cholesterol metabolism, and you now have your glucose and cholesterol in the normal range, and hopefully we can dial down the RAS pathway into the normal range as well. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.